Hello and welcome to another episode of the Azim Digital Asks podcast. Today I'm joined by the founder of Thread and Fable, Rebecca Roberts. She's a chartered marketer with over 16 years of experience in the industry, with a great background in high performance sport as well as the higher education sector. She's really passionate about youth marketing and she regularly talks at events, delivers workshops and regularly shares great content about youth marketing, which is really, really insightful. Sit back, relax and enjoy learning about Rebecca's journey and tips to succeed. Hi Rebecca, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. How are you? I'm really good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Not a problem at all. So rather than me introduce you, I think it's probably better that you introduce yourself. So do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? I can do, yes. So my name is Rebecca Roberts. I'm founder of Thread and Fable, which is a marketing communications agency. We've been going for about three and a half years now. Um, and we sort of specialise in um, kind of interim support, project-based campaigns. Um, we do quite a lot of youth research as well um, and work across kind of higher education, charity and sports sectors. Uh, and before that, I was um, Deputy Director of um, Marketing and Student Recruitment in higher education. And I had about 10 years before that in um, high performance sport. Um, so I worked in sort of three Olympic cycles, premiership football, that kind of stuff. So I've been around a bit. I feel quite old saying all that. And I'm not jealous at all because... For context, we haven't met, right? But I've seen your Twitter picture and you look like you're 21. <laughs> and I look like I'm about three times that age, so I'm definitely jealous. It's all about the filters. <laughs> <laughs> if there's one that adds hair back, I'm all for it. <laughs> but yeah, so purpose of this podcast is uh, we are going to get to know a little bit more about you, how you got to where you are today, what motivates you and whatnot. But first things first, journeying a little bit more into learning about yourself. You are sat in your favourite restaurant. Where are you and what are you ordering? So I think I, if it could be anywhere to now, I'd probably um, be hanging out with my brother um, who lives in New York. And last year we found a, um Italian restaurant in West Village called Codino, which does like lots of small Italian plate foods. It's actually a wine shop. So have a nice glass of red wine and lots of Italian plates of food. Awesome. That sounds interesting. Definitely wanted to check out once we can be within two metres of each other <laughs> again safely. So, yeah, thanks for your introduction. It sounds like you've had a really long and interesting career. When did you realise that, that this was going to be the career for you? Um, so I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to be and still probably not sure what I want to do when I grow up. Um, so I chose a degree. I did a Bachelor of Science in Management at Loughborough Uni. And the beauty of that was I could kind of do a lot of different subjects and choose things like psychology, economics, finance, a bit of marketing, um, lots of statistics and geek stuff like that. Um, and it was actually through um, enjoying those kind of that variation that I was kind of drawn towards the marketing um, side more. So I had a placement with the BBC. Um, I really like the communications and kind of PR side, but I knew that journalism wasn't necessarily going to be what I wanted to do. And then I worked in like a small um, manufacturing business for a marketing placement and had to do quite a lot for them, like literally from end to end sort of sales, marketing, um, digital stuff, website, everything. And that was when I knew that marketing kind of drew on every aspect of the business in my perspective. And I really, I love that. So yeah, that's why I, I kind of knew that it was for me. Awesome. So it sounds like you've kind of had to deal with pretty much every single touch point there. If you could go back to when you first began thinking about what you know now, what advice would you give to yourself? I think it's just to keep um, trying things and be interested. And it's not always, um, you know, what you think you're getting your career, how it will pan out and where you want to go. And that's allowed to change. Like I I do this a lot with people I've kind of mentored and worked with before around like, you know, what you want from a career one year might be different from a year after. Like I've got kids now, I've done um, a bit of travel with my work, but I wouldn't necessarily rule out for the future, but it wouldn't be right now. So it's kind of just keep kind of changing and kind of exploring what you want to do. And I definitely think that in terms of from a marketing perspective, it's very easy when you have worked in sector for a while to think, well, I've got to say, stay in this sector. And it's quite a challenge. It's part of the reason that drove me to I really liked some of the youth stuff I'd started to do in sport around kind of the digital games Beijing was like a big moment around kind of giving more access and 2012 definitely was in terms of the Olympics to engage audiences through social um and we did some sort of student recruitment campaigns in sports science um when I was at the English Institute of Sport 
And that sort of drove me to sort of think, oh, actually, do you know what? I might change sector here and, and sort of test my marketing skills. And ultimately, those marketing, that knowledge is transferable, but it can feel like quite a big leap. So I think I'd probably talk a little bit about that, really, and just say, you know, just try stuff and keep your keep your options open because it's it just seems scarier when you're doing it at the time. But actually, it will it will work out. Definitely. That sounds really interesting. I mean, it sounds like you've learned so much um, over essentially in, in marketing terms, a, a short period of time. Who has been a big inspiration for you in the industry? Um. I think there's probably a few people in different sectors I've worked with. It's not always, I've had like formal mentors and I've had quite a lot of informal ones, like sort of peer to peer or people that I've always kind of reached out to. And I think, I mean, that's another thing I'll probably speak to like as a skill is being able to um, approach people and collaborate with people and just kind of engage with other people in the industry, whether it's on Twitter or whether it's just in an interested capacity can yeah open a lot of doors, but it also is really good for your own connections and your own learning so when I was in sport you know people who met managed me Hester Briley at EIS who'd got a lot of kind of uh, commercial background Emma Grissom was someone who's now at Sport England who again was just really generous with her time and we kind of grew up I guess in in marketing terms in in the sector Um, but I was also mentored by um, Tim Hollingsworth at UK Sport and he's now Chief Exec of Sport England so again learned quite a lot from from him in kind of a senior capacity and then when I moved into higher education I was like right who do I know from sport so Russ Langley who's who was director of marketing at Derby he's still at Derby now actually and he'd I'd worked with him through sport so he was like yeah these are it's a different type of sector I mean in sport everything was quite it was less hierarchical less I guess structured a lot of higher education like committee papers and boards and and that type of thing to get used to so he was really great at sort of saying this is how it kind of works a little bit and um, I was then at a conference and saw Emma Leach speak um when she was at Loughborough and again there was a sport connection there and went over and had a coffee with her and she gave me a lot of her time so I think yeah just sort of really interested in other people's career can kind of help your own and help your own kind of learning and then um yeah people like Dave Musson I've done stuff with um uh, Darren Caveney at Comms 2.0 we delivered workshops together and again from a professional freelancer capacity he's been really generous with his time so I think yeah, it's really good to have those formal mentors, but I think it's the informal conversations. Like Jim Tudor, I remember when I set up, set up on my own, we talked a lot about business and what you've done and all the rest of it. And yeah, I just think it's really nice to kind of bounce off other people. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree about this industry. Certainly one of the things that I've found is that people are very welcoming and very open to having conversations. Not to say that they aren't in other industries, but certainly in the higher education sector, it definitely seems like everybody's door is open so to speak and it sounds like a lot of those people have kind of helped you to shape where you are now in terms of currently and with your business what would you say then has been the biggest challenge that you've had with your business and how did you overcome it um I think working for yourself is is really challenging um I mean for me obviously when you're in-house you you're obviously employed and you've kind of got there's always additional politics but also always like a growing kind of to-do list of things you've got to get done across the business whereas when you work for yourself the beauty is you're more focused on a specific um, aspect of a project or a campaign um, but it's the future pipeline stuff which is challenging so when I'm really busy and I've got a number of projects and campaigns on at once I'm always like okay so what's what's next what does the next six months look like and then you're also your own kind of finance person marketing person business person and I've taken on a few bigger projects this past year where I'm bringing a team together for things so yeah it can get complicated doing doing that um but I think that's you either thrive off that kind of added pressure and stress or you don't like I quite like that buzz of like well do you know what I've got this time with the kids I'm going to enjoy that time after a bit of summer but I'm then going to have to work really hard to get myself out there for the next bit of work so yeah I think that's probably the biggest um sort of challenge I suppose um and then I think with COVID in particular, there's that been that challenge of networking and actually seeing people face to face. I've got like a few workshops I was delivering that were looking at um, different kind of solutions to that. I guess over the next few months, like some people, even if lockdowns sort of lightened even more, probably won't feel comfortable doing some of that face to face for a whole day. So looking at how we can kind of do some stuff online, serialized stuff, so people still get the benefit of like a youth marketing workshop but it's not as intense as in a physical place all day so yeah I think there's lots of different things that have kind of come up that are continually challenging but yeah it's kind of what's enjoyable as well 
definitely it sounds like you have to wear many hats certainly with your own business um yeah. and even more so now with everything that's happening with covid um how do you keep learning how do you keep staying on top or in line with the industry when when do you do that and how do you do that um so i'm chartered um marketeer with the Chartered Institute of Marketing so there's lots of online um, workshops and resources there which are really useful um, and also I'm with the PRCA but I'm looking at CIPR this year as well um, so yeah I go to some workshops but I think you know I had a conversation with some um, peers the other day and we were talking about like lockdown and what we've achieved and there is that I guess pressure like oh we can t- attend more workshops and we can get to stuff and I've been to quite a, lo- a few virtual like youth marketing strategy last week and some of the other events that have been on but it is you know you, you wouldn't normally attend you know a handful of workshops every week on different subjects so I think lockdown is almost like that, is that pressure to sort of be doing and learning all these extra things and sometimes you have to pick and choose what you learn and almost time to reflect that and put that in place because I don't like I hate it when you go to something you write like literally amount of notes and then they just sit there like forever and you don't do anything so I think it's I think learning, continuing to learn is really important. But for me, it's about like making sure you apply that in some way. So it's like picking the things that you really feel like you'll get something off and attending those things is really helpful. Yeah, that's, that's the main thing. Awesome. So it sounds like you've had to do a lot of learning and it seems like a little bit of failing as well. Thinking about failure specifically, and certainly nobody could have planned everything that happened with COVID. In the last 12 months, what would you say has been the biggest failure that you've encountered and and why do you think that's happened um i've got two kind of things i'll probably touch upon so uh, firstly around um i guess kind of a like a marketing 101 like basic stuff around engaging your audience so um i deliver marketing comms consultancy like for a range of different clients um and have a particular passion for youth marketing um and a kind of shared research and open source stuff on that And I've talked about it at events and things. And through that, some people have asked me to kind of contribute to like workshops or planning about how to engage young people. And I'd say the biggest failing that I see, but I kind of see it in all different types of campaigns, but particularly young people, is the lack of involvement of the key audience when building a campaign. So I've done some internal ones where literally they've gone, they're ready to hit go, but no one internally to organisations have any contribution to it. And I've, I've kind of stepped in on a couple of youth ones where, yeah, a group of millennials have come together and it's, they think it's a really great idea, but they've not actually asked quite a young audience who are the kind of end target what they think. And that's, that's the biggest failing for me because it is it is quite simple. I, I think marketing, there's nothing particularly mysterious about it. It's quite a simple exercise of like logic. But um, I'd say that's the biggest failing that I've kind of come across particularly. And I think COVID has kind of almost accelerated that. It's almost because people are a bit more remote and detached, they're almost detaching from that importance of engaging that audience and thinking of them and what's what's in it for them, what's important to them. Um, so I see that as like an ongoing failing. Um, it's good for me, I suppose, we're looking to step in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that happens quite a lot. And then for me personally, um, so most of my work has come through like word of mouth or recommendations, um, people I've known, whatever. Um, and I've pitched for quite a lot as well. And you can go through like lots of tender process and pitches and against like agencies who do it day in day out and I don't tend to do a lot of it um and I've won some this year and I've like lot and failed at a couple this year and it's not been right and it's really hard not to take that personally and I think that's the same for a lot of people in business you just think oh like was that okay like to help myself and I think like imposter syndrome something that I think we all struggle with when you think about like oh like do I know it do I know everything and I have to remind myself yeah. what I tell other people, like no one knows everything. You don't have to be perfect all the time and you can only be yourself. If you're authentically yourself 100% of the time and are honest about what you know and what you think you can deliver and you're not right for a, an organisation, well, that's okay because you would have never been right and they probably aren't right for you. Um, but I, I like when I talk about that, but when it happens to you, you're just like, oh, no, like it's, it's hard. And I think it's just something that we all kind of manage professionally about that but yeah feeling like an imposter yeah I think as you quite rightly said it, it's easier to to pass on the information to our peers but then to take it ourselves it's it's a bit more difficult certainly that resonates with me a lot but yeah it sounds like you have definitely got a lot on your plate so 
Speaking about that, what are you working on right now? So I launched an Engaging Youth 2020 in May, which was my second um, look at kind of all the data and information around children and young people in the UK and what I felt like would be useful for marketing comms people to be aware of, because there is quite a lot around like, hey, look at this trend and they're all on TikTok and this is how you can sell to them. And whilst that's all great, I think it's really important to be mindful of like, there's a lot going on, like health-wise, social inequality, you know, uh, racism, um, the health um, inequality in the UK, life expectancy lower for young people than it's ever been before. Like all those things is kind of, I guess they bother me. So I just felt like it'd be useful to kind of share at that um and i re-edited re-edited it in march and april because of lockdown so it had some kind of early insight things that were coming together but it was released in may so i'm doing a covid specific almost like an update paper because there's been quite a lot of research around you know because we don't know the long-term effects on children and young people what we what we are seeing is you know graduate placements being cut um Yes, some students are deferring, but some are looking at kind of most are looking at to keep their university place. But what does that mean? I'm quite interested in the um, the dynamics there for, for for young people that widen participation that may be on the borderline of going to university and whether they make it. I think they're probably more disadvantaged. So there's lots of stuff I want to kind of share. So that'll be out next month, I think. And then I'm also recording something, my own podcast, which is um, speaking to people who are working in marketing comms because through the workshop that I do which is going to um kind of open up again in September um around kind of youth matters it's run with comms 2.0 um that is really good and we kind of delve into some of the case studies and um people who come along get to kind of put some of that into practice for their own campaigns but through that I've spoken to so many really fascinating much more skilled and interesting people than me um who do that day in and day out so I kind of wanted to bring those stories to the front line because they're just really useful and I, I kind of the research is really great but there's only so many stats you can remember and I feel like the stories behind that are kind of really useful so yeah that's what I'm working on at the moment. Awesome that sounds super interesting and like I've said several times you seem like you've got so many different hats to wear and so many different things going on when do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> wow no um, I just I think, um, do you know what, like the biggest thing for me has been, um, I, like I still have my project work and different client projects, but the whole like the youth marketing stuff is, because I'm really passionate and interested about it, like it sounds really cheesy, like it's not my work, but I think it's always good that you follow stuff that you're personally interested in as well, because it, it is much more enjoyable, like you're, you feel passionate about that side, so the other work and some of the admin stuff, like you just, yeah, you just plate spin. And I've got a couple of kids and I think with lockdown and having to homeschool for the past, like what seems like 500 years, um, I've just become a lot more <laughs> a lot more productive. I was like, how was I ever even busy before? So, um, yeah, I'm, I literally sometimes will just time myself like, right, I've got to smash this out in like an hour, like give myself a time limit, get competitive about it, drill the data and then, and then move on with the rest of the, whether it's maths or English or whatever I'm teaching. <laughs> Awesome. Well, sadly, we are nearly at the end, uh, which is a shame because I could genuinely talk to you for hours. You've got so much and so many interesting things to talk about. However, I'm going to flip the script a little bit and say that if we were to swap roles right now, what question would you ask yourself that I haven't? Do you know what I think I'd ask around um, what gives you that buzz out of marketing? Like, so, yeah, you you like that area of work, but why, why would you stay in it? What do you love? And for me, I think... Like 100%, and like I'll be interested to see your take of that, but you know when you're building a campaign and you kind of like, you've got some data on there and you've got like a gut feeling about something and like excited about creative, but kind of the data telling you want the right stuff and then it kind of builds together and it's almost like build it and they will come. <laughs> and, and when it works out and it, it delivers and you and it kind of works, it, that's just so satisfying when you've kind of had told, you know, staff to kind of, put the best in and we come up with a really good creative and like you kind of make it all work I get incredibly nervous as at campaign launches like Lumos campaign last year was at Wangan World and it was like live streamed like around the world we had like national media covering it and I was literally sat there and there was like a pan to the audience and I had like, like three friends like who were watching it as like supporters as well as my mom and we're like oh my god <laughs> you look so miserable I was like I was literally like oh my god this is like a is this going to happen? Is it going to be okay? And then when things happen and it works out, like for me, that buzz is, yeah, that's the best thing. 
What would you say? Yeah. Why do you love marketing? <laughs> so for me, it's very similar. I think when I first started, I was very keen to get involved in like writing the ads or getting involved in designing or helping design the imagery and having that creative concept. And once it's out there and it's in the wild, I would look at it and think, hmm, yeah, I've, I've had a hand in that. And very similar, I get that buzz from it. Yeah. Now, as I've spent that time in the industry, I think it's it's very much like yourself when everything's out and it's live and you see that data coming in. And if it backs up your original theory or how you'd originally strategize for the campaign to work, the sense of reward is unbelievable. Equally, if it doesn't work as well as you wanted it to, or if the data is telling you something different, then there's a whole other avenue to just, well, a rabbit hole, basically, to just start yeah. working down and, and going down a different avenue, which is super interesting for me. I am literally the, the data guy now, the numbers guy. <laughs> it's definitely about like, something about owning owning it though isn't it like even when the data is like different or people react in a different way it's about like okay well let's let's run with this like let's be agile let's see what that's telling us let's kind of make adjustments so I think as long as you own own that outcome and like you that's why it's so important to base marketing isn't like a oh which color do you prefer and it's not whimsical it's like well we're basing it on this information but sometimes what people say they want and what they want is different so I, I uh, yeah that kind of stuff around the psychology of that is really interesting so as long as people you know that's why I say in teams like isn't it there's no wrong, like wrong response we've just got to work with how it rolls out so I think that that can be really interesting as well absolutely and certainly when there's a project where lots of people have a stake in it and it's just a case of well what color do you like I tend to not say anything because yeah, it's just an additional it. voice yeah I just tend to get in the zone and speaking of in the zone when you are in need of the right soundtrack or the right music in your ears when you're deep in that data and analysis zone and you want maximum productivity what's your go-to song artist or playlist what are you listening to oh god so i think i've got like two modes so there's like fight mode like that's when i've got like right you've got to nail this in an hour you've just got to like get your head into it um and it's kind of like you know i train at the gym and like a lift and stuff so it's like you really got to psych yourself up. It would be something like, I don't know, Not to 100 by Drake or like Power by Kanye, like really over the top psych up music. But then I think the other side of that, I, I have like a focused kind of chill where I'm like, right, I need to get this done today. Like I had a day Monday where I literally had no interruptions and I just had a lot to do. And that would be like Jack Garrett or Surfaces that's so quite chilled, not too chilled, but like <sighs> stuff that's kind of background stuff. So yeah, there's, I have two modes. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I think those types of songs are stuff that I would listen to at the gym. If I were to listen to that while working, I would just be trying my best to rap along and butcher the song <laughs> and not get anything done, basically. <laughs> I love the thought of you just sitting along rapping along while you're working. Now, I don't, I don't, um, like, luckily, I save my raps, so <laughs> I just, I can, I can have that on the background. But yeah, sometimes you just need that type of, like, feisty stuff in the background sometimes. Absolutely. Listen, this has been brilliant. Thank you very much for joining me today. Where can people find out more about you? Where can they get in touch? Okay, so my website's um, threadandfable.com and I'm on Twitter um, at Rebecca7Roberts. Brilliant. Thanks very much for joining me today. I have loved it and I hope you have too. Thank you. It's been great. So that was another great episode in the bag. I'm really enjoying hearing from some of the top names in this industry and I hope that you are too. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating, like, share and subscribe. You can find out more about the podcast on the Twitter page at Azeem Digi Asks, all one word, and also on my website, which is IamAzeemDigital.com. Also, if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, you can get in touch with me via my website. And that's it from me. Looking forward to the next episode already. Take care.